Welcome to South Point Church Online. We want to say hi wherever you're watching from today. And if this is your first time joining us, we're fired up that you showed up. Uh, my name is Matt, and I'm part of the team here today. Hey, I want to kick us off by sharing something that I think might motivate you to kind of stay along for the whole journey. And it's a statement that I think might be true about all of us. And I'm going to put it up on the screen as this. Setting ourselves up for suffering is just not smart for any of us. Listen, I get it. Some of you today, you showed up and you're kind of spiritually curious and you're checking out Jesus. Some of you, you may have come from a different faith background and some of you, you grew up in church. But regardless of where you fall on that spectrum, any of us that set ourselves up for suffering, that just isn't smart. That's why we've been in the middle of this series that I'm gonna put up on the screen called Surviving the Age of Rage, right? It seems like Everybody everywhere is just angry. And as I'm preparing for this series, I came across a quote that I think sums up this message almost in a nutshell. And so I wanna put this quote up on the screen and share it with you this morning, and here it is. Responding to rage with rage never serves anyone. No one wins and everyone loses. And what I love about this statement right here is it says never. Like rage never wins and it never works. And I love that it says no one wins and everyone loses. So rage never works and everyone loses. Now here's what's really interesting and kind of cool about this quote. And this may come to a shock to you. Did you know this quote doesn't actually come from the Bible? This quote doesn't even come from like a Christian author who wrote a book about anger. And this quote doesn't even come from another pastor who gave a sermon about anger. This quote actually comes from a clinical psychologist who wrote an article for Psychology Today in the year 2020. And what's neat about this is science just confirms what God has been telling us for a really long time. Matter of fact, this idea that rage never works and everyone loses is something that God's been telling us for a really long time. We see this in Proverbs and we're gonna put it up on the screen as this. A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh word makes tempers flare. I mean, when someone's mad at us, responding in kind never works. It always makes things worse, right? It just doesn't make it better. Everyone loses. And you might be thinking this, and I get it because what I think is we all go, duh. Like, we know that in our minds, but in our practical actions, that's really, really hard to do. Today, I want to share a true story about my wife and I, and I don't think I've ever shared uh, this story in church uh, because it's really embarrassing, mostly about me, and it happened to me and my wife in our first two years of marriage. This is way before we had kids. It's way before we moved here to the county that we live in now, um, and like I said, it was our first year or two of marriage, and I can't even remember what we were arguing about, but I remember where we were. We were kind of in our bedroom, and we were arguing. I mean, she was on one side of the room, and I was on the other side of the room, um, and it kind of kept escalating. She said something, and then I would say something, and then she would say something, and I would say something, and then she would kind of up the volume, and then I would up the volume, and then she would up the anger, and I up the anger. And finally, like, and my wife is a pretty mild-mannered person, so I'll never forget, she was so angry, she just yelled, I'm done. She went over the main bathroom out of our bedroom door, and then slammed the door, and you could hear the lock go click. And man, I'm telling you, that thing, that, that response of anger and rage, man, it set me off. And before I could stop myself, I had kicked in the door and was screaming at her, don't you ever do that again. And the expression on her face in that very moment told me that we both had lost in that moment. And I'm thankful to say that I've never acted like that again since that moment. And I get it that rage isn't really helpful and it never causes anything good and everyone loses, but knowing that and actually being able to do something different are two different things. And it got me thinking, have you ever responded to anger or rage with just more anger or rage? Maybe for you, it was in a conversation with a good friend, right? Your good friend always enjoys you, except when he or she gets a boyfriend or a girlfriend, right? And then they kind of dump you for their boyfriend or girlfriend, and he and she is off doing their thing, and they forget about you. And then when that ends, they come back to you, and they try to be besties. And finally, you have a conversation with your friend about, hey, this isn't working, and they get mad, and you get mad, and the next thing you know, there's a friendship that's lost because you responded to anger and rage with just more anger 
and rage. Maybe it happened to you and a coworker, right? You're working on something together, it doesn't go the way you think, and so they blame you, you blame them, and all of a sudden it escalates, they get angry, you get angry, and every time you go to the office, you guys avoid each other. And I'm gonna talk about if anybody knows how to push your buttons, it's a spouse, right? Can I just get an amen in the chat, right? Like if anyone knows how to push your buttons, it's your spouse, right? And whether it's he or she, but sometimes in a moment where we're just tired or we're exhausted or we're stressed, right? We may snap or say something that isn't just nice and, and we just took it a little bit too far. And so what is our response is? We just go, oh, you're not gonna do that to me. And so we respond and then it kind of, it kind of uh, escalates and then someone's sleeping out on the bean bag couch because we got mad at each other. And the last one, and this is one that saddens my heart because I, I know it's happened to me, is like, have you ever been ready uh, to go see family or to go on vacation with your kids, right? And you're trying to get everyone to the car, or the minivan or whatever your vehicle is, right? But as usual, kids are running late or like people, it just isn't going the way you want. And so you kind of snap and then your kid snaps back and you go, oh, that's not how this is gonna go. And you just lay into them and they start crying. And as you're starting your beautiful vacation, your vehicle is full of anger and silence and and kids crying. And I get it, like it's probably happened to all of us, right? Where we responded to someone's anger or rage with just more anger and rage, and everyone lost. And it leads us to a problem that I bet every person who's watching this has had to deal with. And I'll put it up on the screen and it's this right here. Fighting rage with rage can feel like a win. Like, I mean, when someone gets mad at us and they make us angry, right, and they hurt us, I mean, it feels good to give them a zinger and it, it feels good to get them back and it feels good to go, you're not gonna run over me. Fighting rage with rage can feel like a win, but it creates a loss for everyone. I mean, both science and God tell us that when we respond to rage with rage and anger, everyone loses. And regardless of where you're at on the faith spectrum and how you've responded to Jesus, it leaves all of us today asking an important question. If everyone is mad everywhere, how do we answer the following question we're gonna put up on the screen? And it's this right here. How do we change our default response to rage so we can avoid self-inflicted loss, right? I mean, here, here's the reality, right? Like my default position, your default position, right? Our default position is, is that when someone gets angry or rages at us, what do we do? We get angry right back and we rage right back. That's our default response, even though we know that actually doesn't solve anything. And here's where the problem gets even a little bit worse, right? In a world that is busted and broken and full of flawed people because all human beings are flawed, right? There are no perfect people, right? So the world's busted and broken, we're all flawed, right? So dealing with anger or someone's rage is gonna be a common occurrence. Dealing with someone's rage or anger at us is unavoidable. This isn't an if question, this is almost a daily when question. So how do we change our default setting so that we don't create self-inflicted loss in, the, in our own lives? Now, this is where the good news comes in. And this is what makes so much sense to me about following Jesus. God knew that you, God knew that me, God knew that every single person would wrestle with this issue, right? God knew that we would have to deal with this problem. Jesus actually addresses this very issue so that you and I wouldn't have to create self-inflicted consequences in our life. And one of the things that I really love about Jesus is he doesn't tell us the things that we wanna hear. Jesus tells us the things that we need to hear that address everyday real life. So when it comes to responding to someone else's rage and anger with rage and anger, Jesus is brutally honest about the problem, and he's also brutally honest about the solution. And so we're gonna kinda of take a look at today at the words of Jesus to address something that all of us are gonna face. And remember, if this seems a little bit harsh, it's because Jesus is trying to help us. Now Jesus addresses this in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Matthew, and we're gonna pick it up, and he says this. He says, you've heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. Right? Like, that sounds pretty good, right? Like, that's a good rule. Like, we shouldn't kill each other. Everyone on the other side of the screen is nodding their head, right? He says, you've heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone. And here Jesus teaches us a basic principle that I think all of us get but rarely say out loud. And it's this, the horrific on the outside always starts with the bad on the inside, right? The just the horrible on the outside always starts with the bad. So Jesus says like, you know murder's wrong, 
But I'm trying to tell you that if you're even angry with someone, well, what does he go on to say? He goes on to say this. He says, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. So Jesus tells us two other things. He tells us there's kind of this ongoing thing where we kind of ramp ourselves up. First, we get upset. And then when we're upset, we're like, whoa, 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 you're in the danger zone. And then we get angry and the warning bell should go off, right? And then he says, when you get into full blown rage, man, you need to grab the fire extinguisher and start to put that out. And Jesus uses the term like when you curse someone, when you're in rage mode, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Now, whenever you use the word hell, I get it. You know, if you're here with a different faith background exploring Jesus, for sometimes you might go, ah, that's my problem with God. And I think we need to understand what hell is because what if hell is really just God's love and dignity for human beings? And here's what I mean. You know this and I know this. True love requires choice. And at some point, and some people will choose to go, God, I don't want to love you, I don't want to follow you, and I don't want to be with you. And so God in dignity and love says he'll honor that choice, and God removes himself from people who don't want him. Well, what happens when we remove God, and God is all love, God is all good, God is all the beauty, all the things that we admire. When we remove God and all that is good with that, all that is left is that that is busted and broken and ugly, and it is hell. And then Jesus tells us when we rage, that is the absence of any goodness or compassion, that just like when God removes himself, all that's left is bad, when we execute in rage, there's nothing good in it. All that's left is bad. And Jesus is telling us that when we go from upset to angry into rage, we literally bring hell here on earth. And it's something we should avoid. God has been telling us from the beginning and science confirms it never serves anyone and everyone loses. So what's the solution? And Jesus' solution, here's what I like about it. His solution is so easy. Like, it's complex. It's not complex. Like, this is just a simple solution. But just because it's simple and not complex doesn't make it easy. Jesus tells us this in the eyewitness account of the Gospel, Luke, who records this kind of conversation that Jesus is having. He says this, love your enemies. Whoa, whoa, Jesus. Like, I can love my friends. And I can love people who look like me, vote like me, and think like me, right? But Jesus goes, you're missing the point. Like, everyone does that, right? People always care about people who are like them and are nice to them. He goes, well, everyone does that. You should do something different. He says, love your enemies. And then I love what Jesus says. Jesus says, do good to them. Jesus doesn't say think good thoughts about them. Jesus doesn't say don't do evil to them. Jesus says the opposite. He says we should proactively do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be paid. And then your reward from heaven will be very great. He's saying, listen, when you respond with something other than anger, rage, and being upset, you're going to get a very different result. Now it seems a little bit like Jesus, like how can I love someone who's who's being angry at me and, and creating hurt in my life? And like, how, how do I actually like do good to them? And then Jesus goes on to explain why this is so important. He says this, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. He's saying, listen, if you do good to them and you're kind to your enemies, then you're being like your heavenly father. For God is kind to those that are unthankful and wicked. I know that in our country and our culture, there are those who claim to be Christians, who tell you that God is angry and against you. And Jesus is saying that God is kind and he is to those who are unthankful and wicked. And it says, you must be compassionate. And then there's that phrase, we've we've talked about it before, just as your father is compassionate. You see, when we were God's enemy, when we were cruel and unkind and disobedient to God, God gave us compassion. And the same compassion that we receive from God is something that we're supposed to pass on. Now, if you're here today and you're kind of exploring this whole Jesus thing or you haven't said yes to him, you get to sit back and eat popcorn. However, if you're here today and you have said yes to Jesus, then this is a must. This is a command. This isn't a choice. The same compassion and grace God gave us when we didn't deserve it is what we're supposed to give to those who don't deserve it. And so when we rage, we bring hell, and Jesus says, that isn't good. We can all nod our head and say, yep, we shouldn't do that. And so what is the solution? Is to love our enemy, is to do good, is to bring kindness and compassion 
to people who rage and are angry at us. The same way when we were raging and angry at God, he sent his son Jesus who loved us and who willingly died on a cross and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. He lost so we could win. And as followers of Jesus, it's the same principle that we should execute when people rage at us. We lose so that we and they can win. And I think we kind of get that concept. I think regardless of where you are in kind of the faith journey, I think we all get that like raging against rage really doesn't work. But how do we practically kind of change what's going on on the inside? And so I want to kind of sum up what Jesus is asking us to do. We're going to put it on the screen. It's this. Resetting our default response to rage is not only the right thing to do, it gets better results. The reason that most of us say yes to Jesus isn't because that we're worried about a place called hell. It's because we realize that our Heavenly Father loves us and that He is good and He is compassionate and He's kind. It is the grace and love found in a person named Jesus that transforms our heart. See, resetting our default is not only right, it gets different results. But the question is, is how do we actually reset our default position, right? Because it's just normal. When someone gets angry at us and rages at us, what do we do? We get angry and we rage right back, right? So how do we reset that default position? And so today, I want to give us three practical ways I think we can honor the words and the teachings of Jesus to reset our default position, okay? And so here's observation number one that I'm going to put on the screen is first, move our mindset from winning to winsome. I get it. When someone dings us, when someone is angry, someone hurts us, man, we go into, I'm going to win. You don't get to get away with that. My rights come first, right? But the first thing we need to do is going, I'm not going to win about my rights. I want to move from my rights to our relationship. Instead of winning and getting ahead and making it even and getting payback, I'm more concerned less about my rights and more about our relationship. And that's exactly what God did for us, right? Jesus lost so that we could win. And that's what Jesus calls his followers to do. We need to change your mindset and go, listen, it's not about me winning. It's not about my rights. It's about winning the relationship and and, 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 and like restoring that relationship. Uh, Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about, of moving from winning to winsome. Um, In our early years of marriage, when we had young kids, my wife and I had moved to where we currently live, and and my wife was working from the home, and I was working probably anywhere from 80 to 100 hours a week in my job. It was pretty busy, and we had two young kids. They were 18 months apart, and so uh, my wife knows when I get stressed because I start to clean, and she'll say, you are one of the best cleaners I've ever met because when I get stressed, I like order. I like things to look clean and orderly, and it just there's something in my life that's broken from my past that when things look clean and put together and orderly, it makes me feel safe and secure. The problem is I would come home from work, I would be exhausted, and the house would be a disaster. And I would start to get mad and frustrated. And after a couple times of being mad and frustrated and realizing I was calling, causing pain in my kids and causing pain in my wife, I realized I had a choice to make. I could win and have a clean house, but at the cost of my relationship with my kids and my wife. And that doesn't mean we had to live in a pigsty, but it did did mean I had to change my expectations. And I would rather have a little bit of a messy house and win in my marriage with my kids, to give up what mattered to me so that I could have the right kind of relationship with my wife and with my kids. And I think the first step to resetting our default default position of responding to rage with rage is not go, how do I get what I deserve? How do I make sure people get what they deserve? It's to ask, how does the relationship win? To move less about me and more from me to we. And then it leads me into the second thing that will help us reset our default position is this fight self-righteous pride. You know what I've said most of my adult life, and I bet you've said this. So just just stay with me here for a second. So like, you want to focus, you don't want to miss it. When I say this, you're going to go, "Uh uh-huh. Here's what we say when when people get mad at us and they treat us poorly, right? And we're just going to explode and get mad at them. We go, I would never treat them that way, right? How many of us have ever said, I would never do that. I would never treat them that way. And see, the reality is, is what we're saying is, is I'm better than them. That somehow if I was born with their parents 
If I was born with their personality, if I was born with their kind of leanings and, and their quirks, right? If I was born with all the things that happened to them and all the situations that they face, and I was born with a kind of their temperament and their emotional temperament, spiritual temperament, and their intellectual temperament, and I faced all the exact same circumstances, I would make a different response to them because I'm inherently better. And if we're really honest, that is a dead wrong thing. And so we need to fight against the self-righteous prize that said, oh, if I was them, I would have done that differently. And you know how I know we wouldn't do it differently? Because all of us have gotten it wrong. All of us have had the choice to get it right, and we didn't. And it's not like we got it wrong one time. If we're really honest, we've gotten it wrong a whole lot in our life. And so the thing to make that shift, right, from a response of like just rage to something different, to doing good, is to go, how do I fight against self-righteous pride? I've learned this the hard way. True story, I have a really good friend, and uh, uh, this was a while ago, this was probably 10, 10, maybe 12 years ago, and this friend uh, and I were good friends, uh, but this friend, uh, we had this incident. He didn't ask for it, I didn't ask for it. I had to respond to this incident, um, and um, it it ruined our friendship. He, he handled it really well. He, he kind of stepped away from our friendship in a, in a kind of a right way, but doesn't like me and, and I think feels hurt by, by me. And I can remember walking through that situation, and here's the thing, I know my friend's background. I know my friend's personality. I knew how he grew up. I knew his current situation. And even though I don't know if there's anything that I could have done different or better, and maybe there is, but I've replayed that situation over and over, and I don't think I could have done any better. But here's the thing. I'm not angry or mad at my friend because I think if I was in his shoes, if I put myself in his place, I would feel exactly the way that he felt. You see, we have to fight against the self-righteous pride that says, oh, if I was them, I would do it differently. And the reality is, is that we wouldn't. If we were them with all the exact same things, because we're broken, we would do exactly what they would do. And what I discovered is pride is when I would say I would do something differently if I was in the exact same shoes, exact same person, because there's something inherently better about me than them. And here's the truth that Jesus tells us all. There are no perfect people. All of us are equally flawed. All of us get it wrong. There's something on the inside of all humanity that's broken. That's why religion will never work. And that's why Jesus died on the cross. That's why it's Jesus plus nothing. Jesus paid for our sin penalty because we're all busted and broken. And so we're all equal at the foot of the cross. So one of the ways that we can kind of reset our response is first is go, listen, it's not about me winning, it's about winning in the relationship. And the second thing is to go, listen, I'm no better than them. If I was in their shoes and their thing, I'd probably make the same mistake and the, and the same thing and probably even respond the way they did because the reality is, is I'm not better than they are which leads me to the third practical thing that we can do to reset our response to rage, and it's this. Freely pass along compassion and kindness. The reality is, is we've all messed up. We all owed God a debt we couldn't pay. We've all got it wrong. We all knew it was wrong. We all did it anyway. We all said, we don't care what God thinks. There've been times where we've been mad at God and we were just angry and we did what we wanted to do, right? And God didn't give us what we deserved. God in love freely gave us grace. Just as God was kind and compassionate, we must be kind and compassionate. You see, the grace that we get from Jesus, it's given freely. That's why it's called the gospel, which is simply the term good news, is that we can be forgiven and loved, not because we earned it or deserved it or because we were born in the right country or the right bank account or the right skin color or the right intellectual, none of that. Freely because Jesus died on the cross. It's a free gift. All we have to do is actually receive it and say yes and surrender. So we should just pass on. We're undeserving people who just pass along the kindness and compassion that was given to us. 
Uh, COVID has made me a little bit sad. I spent the last four years before COVID um, powerlifting is my hobby, trying to get to a goal of lifting 2,000 pounds between my squat, my bench, and my deadlift. And I was about 50 pounds away. Uh, and there was this time I was training in the gym. Um, and it was a busy time in the gym, kind of early, uh, early afternoon, early evening. It gets really popular. Everyone from base gets off a little bit early, those that want to work out. And so I went to the squat rack. And there's only two squat racks in the gym. And so this is just some etiquette if you, if you ever worked out in the gym. And there was somebody in the squat rack. So I went over and said, hey, I, I have deadlifts today. Would you mind if I worked on the back end? And they said, hey, I really wouldn't prefer if you, if you didn't. I said, that's great. I tuned in. It was a guy. One of the girls, I was like, great, I understand. And so I'm, I'm setting up my deadlift bar um, a few feet away, kind of in an area that is not made for deadlifts, right? And all of a sudden, as I'm looking in the, in the, in the squat rack, this guy is doing bicep curls. And so just free, free advice, never use a squat rack to do bicep curls. That, that, that's a party foul. So don't ever do that guy or girl, don't do curls in a squat rack. And so I, I said to the guy, just I said, hey man, like, and I said it just like this, hey man, I said, do you, does it make sense? I'd be a little frustrated, like you're doing curls in a squat rack and, and I can't do this. And no lie, I said it just like that. I try to be kind and polite and compassionate, right? And he looked at me and said, I don't give. And then he cussed at me what you feel, put his headphones back in and turned around. And man, I want to tell you, I was really, really frustrated. But like everyone knows I'm a pastor and I love Jesus and I'm supposed to do the things Jesus tells me. So I, all right, I'm just going to go do my deadlifts. Later that evening as I was leaving, uh, the manager of the gym who knows me because I've been going there for a really long time said, hey, I heard what happened. I'm going to talk to him. This isn't the first time this person has responded poorly to someone with gym etiquette. Uh, we're probably going to ask them not to come back anymore. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Everyone has a bad day. He was just having a bad day. And the reality is, is that when we have a bad day, you know what we want? We want to pass. We want someone to go, hey, it's just a bad day. I'll give you grace today because tomorrow I may need it. And so the thing that we can do is freely pass along compassion and kindness, which leads me up. If I was going to sum up this, this whole idea, I would sum it up this way right here. Practicing humility. You see, we have to practice it because our default setting is not humility. Our default position isn't to go, oh, like it's more about the relationship than it is about payback. It isn't our default position to go, you know what? I'm as equally broken as you are. And if I was in your place, I might respond the exact way. It isn't our default position to go, oh, God freely forgave me. God undeservingly gave me grace. Maybe I should undeserve it. That's not, that's why we need to practice humility. Keeps us from the hypocritical reaction of rage because it's self-destructive. When we respond to rage because we think someone's hurting us, all we're doing is doing what they did to us. We're being hypocrites. And so humility keeps us from reaction that causes self-inflicted loss in our lives. And so I just have one challenge. So it doesn't matter whether you're here kind of exploring who Jesus is. It doesn't matter if you came from a different faith background or you've been going to church and you said yes to Jesus all of your life. Here's my challenge. Is, is that when someone is at their worst, you would give them the grace this week that you would give yourself when you're at your worst. Let me say that again. When someone's at their worst, give them the grace that you want when you're at your worst. You know that grace when you ask God, hey, I knew I blew it. I yelled at my wife or my kids or my boss. I knew I, I said something I shouldn't have. I know in the car, I honked more. You know that grace when we weren't our best that we want from other people? How about we give that same grace to people when they're at their worst that we want when we're at our worst. You know, it's amazing that I've had to learn some of these lessons the hard way because I think my adopted mom and dad were the greatest examples of practicing humility and not responding in a way uh, that they got treated. You see, I was talking to my, my two daughters earlier this week just about life and the world, and I said, do you realize that your dad was homeless? At one point in my life, I could carry everything that I belonged in a hamper and I had no place to live. And my adopted mom and dad, who were youth pastors at another church, um, invited me to come live with them and provide a home. Now, when they gave me this free home and free food, and were going to love me and take me as their own, they set healthy boundaries. And that's the thing, is you can show loving kindness and still set boundaries. 
you can do good without letting people continue to harm you. So I'm not saying you can't set boundaries. So my, my adopted mom and dad gave me a place to live and they set healthy boundaries. But I was a knucklehead of a kid and I started acting out and doing things that were harmful to myself and harmful to the family. And my dad, my mom sat me down and said, hey, listen, when you came to live with us, we set the guardrails, right? Here's the sidelines. And when you go outside the sideline, that's a party foul. And I said, I don't care. I want to live how I want to live. And they said, if you're going to do that, you can't live here. And I'll never forget, I hurt their feelings. I broke their heart. They loved me. They gave me a place to live. And I told them to pound sand and I went and like did my own thing. And my own thing, as you can kind of guess, didn't work out. And I was homeless again. And guess who took me back in when I didn't deserve it? My adopted mom and dad. It was in that moment for the first time in my life, someone gave me something that I didn't deserve. Like I deserve some payback. I deserve some punishment. But they didn't give me what I deserved. They gave me the undeserved grace, kindness, and compassion that God had given them. They had passed on to me. And so, in an angry world, where everyone's angry, everywhere, and you might get some of that anger and rage, instead of responding in kind that never actually works and causes everyone to lose, what if you, what if me, what if we responded with the grace, kindness, and compassion that God gave us when we didn't deserve it, even though someone might deserve it, and bring a better relationship and point people to Jesus? Because when we do that, we move from losing to winning. And I'm grateful that Jesus tells us the brutal truth and a very simple answer to solve something that all of us are going to have to deal with. Hey, let me pray. Hey, God, thank you. Thank you for loving us. God, I pray that when we are at our worst, we are forgiven, not because we get it right, but because you are good and because Jesus died on the cross. And God, I pray we all carry hurts and we're all going to face hurts in the coming days, months, and years where someone hurts us. And God, the same way, when we were at our worst, you gave us kindness and compassion. God, we want to give kindness and compassion in a way that honors you and points people to Jesus. God, help us to do that in a way that makes you smile. In Jesus' name, amen. And never forget, you matter deeply to God.